first is this set that you used to describe this arithmetic language where we have S0, which is an empty set. And then this recurrent definition of SI plus one. And then it asks how many elements does S3 have? So just I need to get the cardinality of the set. And how to split this book. Can you see my whole screen? Yeah. All right, so we have three elements plus three times the cardinality of the previous set. And then this is this is like the cardinality of previous set times itself, time n times itself. So we have this, and for the first set is zero, the, the S1 is three, S2 is like 39, and S3 is a large number. I guess I guess this is this exercise just tells us that the combination of uh, programming languages can be exponentially large. And you trivially have tons, tons and of programs. Exercise five, 3.5.10 is to rephrase the previous definition as set of inference rule. So there are three rules at here. So I have three inference rules. If and then just become the premise and the conclusion. And this for all T, so it's just become uh, XM. And same for this one. All right, this. This asks if we add some weird rule to the language, which of the theorems remain valid. So the rule says if true, then T2 else T3 becomes T3. So this rule, I also write it here. It's like exactly opposite of this rule. As a result, our calculation is no longer deterministic because we have two rules for the same syntax.
So every value is the normal form, which means every value, just every value, AK in this case, true and false, don't have any rule to transit it into somewhere else, which is still true. If T is a normal form, then T is a value is also valid. Everything which is not a value in this case is this condition will be reduced into a value eventually. And yeah, this uniqueness of normal form means that when syntax will always become one normal form, but it's clearly invalid because in this case, we can get T2 and we can also get T3. And yeah, termination is still valid. And suppose we add this rule. So this rule says that we will evaluate T2 first, the conditional branch. So T2 becomes strict. This is also not deterministic because it's also conflict with this rule, which evaluate T1 first. But then the uniqueness of normal form is still valid because no matter which term we evaluate first, at the end, we get the same result, at least in this language. Yeah, I didn't do this one. This one sounds interesting, but it also takes a long time, so I didn't do that. Also, this one, this one says, uh, what if the big step semantics and small step semantics coincide? So we need to prove this if and only if relationship. So usually for if and only if, I think we need to do both side. So I start to, so we need to do both side, but then I didn't do that. Yeah, basically I, I didn't do any time consuming ones. And the last, last exercise says that, suppose we want to change the evaluation strategy so that then and else are evaluated before the guard. So which means we need to first evaluate T2, just like, this funny rule, but the difference is that um, we don't have those three rules anymore. We need to rewrite them from scratch. So we have this rule for T2. And then, then when T2 becomes a value, we evaluate T3. When both of them become a value, we evaluate T1. And then we have those simple cases. Which is still the same. Except we have a precondition now that that T2 and T3 becomes values. Right, and I 
didn't do the chapter four. I plan to set up a OCaml code base later though. Any questions and comment on this? Are all the questions? Uh, well, for this one, I know we need to do rule induction next, but I'm not very sure how to do it. Anyone have the idea? I, I think maybe we need to do induction on this and then says that in each different rules, this V will eventually correspond to one of the V here. Maybe. Yeah, I will try that later. Yeah, I think you're right. I think it's you know, it's just going to be a bit tedious because there's a lot of rules. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I don't plan to try the whole thing. I just plan to try to say if it work. Mm -hmm. I, mm. I I showed a, a formalization of it last week, and it ends up being there's only two things he had to check or something. But he he has all the answers in the appendix. If you, oh, you, you I got don't lost. Know that. Yeah. So we can yeah. cheat. That, that is good to know. Yeah. That's pretty hard to, to do that proof without the appendix. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Well, let's talk about chapter five, which is lambda calculus. Is something interesting is that there are pi calculus and object calculus, and who knows whatever other calculus people invented in the last 20 years. Yeah, all those are pretty big ones. No, you are muted. Oh, oh, sorry. Oh, yeah. I guess on 17, I said that I, I actually just tried to do like the if and only if on the induction, like retain the if and only if. So I did induction on terms instead of the rules because it seemed a little bit easier. I, it was just, I was like, yeah, doing rule induction will take a, like, just be tedious and take a long time. So I was just trying to like shortcut it somehow. All right. I just want to flag my brain doesn't seem to be working properly today. <laughs> For some reason, I just thought I had to reply to Ryan in the chat when I was, I could just have said it but anyway. <laughs> that, that seems pretty normal to reply with the same medium <laughs> that someone spoke in the first place yeah yeah, yeah. So my thought is just that i didn't think of it oh. <laughs> <laughs> 
Can you make it a little bit bigger, please? So basically this long paragraph says that lambda calculus uh, embodies this kind of function definition and application in purest form and everything else don't exist at least in like pure lambda calculus, but we can represent them as function applications. So the syntax of lambda calculus is, is very simple. It's just we have variables, we have abstraction, and we have application. So this is basically the lambda syntax. And this is the application syntax in like ML-like language. In other language, we will have parentheses. And lambda calculus always have one argument for each function. And here is a uh, Talk about abstract and concrete syntax. I think it's basically talk about like in this book, we always talk about abstract syntax, even though we write them as concrete syntax. Also, it's also a side comment on variable and meta variable. So it says that we have some meta variables like T and S and U, which, which stand for a term in the syntax. And then we have some variables X, Y, and D, which, which are variables in our language. But it's then comment that we can show the difference in the context because a sentence like the like this where it is we can we can see that the x y are like actual variables and z and s are meta variables. But also the book will use the convention that, that X and Y and Z are actual variables. Even though here there is a meta variable, I guess. Here is the talk about scope of lambda calculus and also some terminology. So a variable X is said to be bound when it occurs in the body T of an abstraction. Otherwise, so occurrence of X is free. So examples like X in XY are free 
and in yeah in this is free but the ones in like x dot x and this are bounded and in this case this x is bound but this one is free and the term with no free variables is said to be closed closed terms are also called combinators interesting I had to admit, I, my brain is still really fuzzy about what a combinator is. I guess it's a term with no free variables. That's it, basically. Yeah. They are interesting because if you can work out combinators that are kind of a basis for the whole language, then you don't need variables, which is what Curry did. This combinator calculus. So each step of in the comp computation basically we write by substitution, which they use a different notation than the Harper book. I think this one, the Harper book is more standard than this arrow notation. But this arrow yeah. notation is yeah, easier to understand, I think. Yeah, I agree completely. I can see why you use it. Yeah. Easier. Yeah, but most, yeah, most literature I've seen use this that slash notation rather slash, than arrow. Yeah. I think the thing is once you get used to that, it's um you know easy to read. My problem is that it I also uh, it's not that easy to conflict with this arrow. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, this is a bit heavier because you've got to have well, no, it's not really. Well, it's hard to type if you don't have Unicode on your keyboard you know, or in your true. editor. Yeah. True. Yeah, but Why should with the slashes? People the, just it, text those with latex, so it doesn't matter that much. Yeah. Don't the brackets, like the substitution, come after the term usually too, instead of before? No, I think they're usually in front. It's kind of like matrix multiplication. You know, usually the transform is in front or whatever. But, yeah. I have seen it as a subscript afterwards, but... um. Yeah, my problem is that the slash sometimes, I, in some cases, it matters whether it's left or right, and sometimes, in some formalisms, you use forward slash and backslash, and so I always get confused which way it's supposed to go, like which is the variable and which is the re replacement. Yeah, I watched uh, guys do talk about, like people just invent different substitution notations with subtle differences. The worst offenders are like there are people using like this x substitute y but they also do it opposite just change the order <laughs> without changing the notation it's just yeah. messy yeah and if you if you use the lambert calculus then you have substitution on the left and substitution on the right so it makes a difference which way the slash goes it just gets confusing yeah Just need to be aware of what kind of notation people use. Sorry, Lambert calculus is not substitution. It's placement on the left or placement on the right. It doesn't make any sense to substitute. So here it says that a term in the form like this is called a uh, redex, uh, which means reducible expression. And then an operation to rewrite a redex 
is called beta reduction. So then it talks about there are different way of doing beta reduction, different what we call evaluation orders. On the full beta reduction, any radix may be reduced at any time. So it's non-deterministic, we just pick one and do it. Under the normal order strategy, the leftmost, outermost redex is always reduced for first. No, so we get rid of this ID first and then this ID. Yeah, this is kind of like the lazy evaluation strategy. Yeah. yeah. But still not restrictive enough. This is actually the lazy strategy because this this will have abstraction also be reduced. Yeah, it, yeah, it reduces then, under inside of functions, basically, yeah. So those two are basically more like on paper, mm -hmm. beta reduction, but in actual programming languages, people are more like using this kind of Call by name strategies are uh, like, yeah, just a lot no reduction inside abstraction. Otherwise, it's the same. So it also comments that Haskell actually used an optimized version known as call by need. So basically, call by name with memoization it will cache when you first calculate a term and if you repeatedly do the same work, it will, you do, don't need to do it. I get like the important thing there is like the last sentence where it's, it's actually, instead of your expression being like a string, it's a graph. Yeah, it's and graph. so you can, you can have shared yeah. nodes in the graph, yeah. And yeah, most languages use copy value strategy, which is what we call eager or strict. And yeah. The difference is strict strategy calculates all the argument. Really strategies only evaluate the arguments that are actually used. And the book for further comment that evaluation strategy doesn't matter that much when we talk about types. So we will always use call by value. In this book, at least.
Uh, and David mentioned another notation in the a different textbook. So, <laughs> but I guess math people have different notation compared to computer scientists already. Yeah, I guess the thing that I brought up about the brackets coming after, that's I feel like that's more common in logic. And so something like what David said, it may be more familiar for logic from logic yeah. standpoint. Yeah, it could be. Okay, this says the uh, lambda calculus provides no building support for multi-argument functions. We can add something like a tuple, but we can also do that with so-called higher order functions that yield functions as a result. So basically currying. I think most people in this group know what currying is. Does anyone want explanation? Okay, so let's skip that. And there's an interesting thing that is that we can encode encode different data types as functions. So church boolean are uh, like true and false are uh, like this. We take two arguments and return true. We take two arguments and return false. I think in hyped lambda calculus is no longer possible. Anyone can confirm or deny? Larry, what was that? Is it possible to define church boolean in typed lambda calculus? Yeah, sure. Sure? Yeah. Uh, I mean, uh, well, I mean, it have to be polymorphic type, right? Oh, yeah, yeah, you're yeah. right. But we can define the combinator test with a property that test B V W will reduce to V when B is true and reduce to W when B is false. So it is like a if expression, but I guess because it's a function. The difference is that all the arguments are eagerly evaluated. So test is implemented as that. If we say, if we say we have L is true, then we have We have M, M as, as true and false, so we will get M as a result. Same as L is false. Okay. 
this is basically say the same thing. It also define Boolean operator like logical conjunction. Given two Boolean value B and C, return C if B is true and false if B is false. We have exercise, which we will talk about next time. So using Booleans, we can encode pairs of values and using true and false to extract them. And then we will have something interesting. We can have numbers. Which has a successor and zero. And for zero number, we just get zero. And for later numbers, we just apply successors n times. And here is the interesting observation that C0 and the previous false are actually exactly the same, just with different name for arguments. So in this definition, zero and false are the same, which is like in language like assembly or C. That's why we need types because otherwise, yeah, there are no way to distinguish that. Successor function is a combinator that takes a number and us and then apply s to the previous number, which means this is it's just add one to the number. It's another exercise. So there are more than one way to define this successor function.
pluses. How does plus work? I can go through it if you want. Sorry, what? I can I can go through it if you want. Yeah, sure. So I mean, since these uh, numbers like this n s z just applies s n times to z, right? And then after we're done with that, we're going to reply s m times to z. So they were actually applying s m plus n times. Right, where since a church normal is just defined as how many times it applies its first yes. parameter to its second one. Yeah. All right. And it's kind of the same thing. If you look at the times thing next, you can, it's a similar thing. Yeah. We're going to apply plus n, m times. So that's m times n of applications. Oh, this this is a valuable insight. Mm -hmm. So they, we can do these exercises too. I think they're all pretty simple. Um, yeah. So it's, how would you do it without plus? Substitute, yeah, substitute yeah. the whole thing into here, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, you can just do n, or like so, add an extra parameter, like uh, add an x parameter. So it'd be m n s and C, I guess, or Z. And then you're just gonna actually, instead of plus N, it would be just N, S, right? So N, S is apply S N times. Does that make sense? Like if you leave, if in, uh, I mean, in if like where it says N, S, Z, if you leave off the Z, then N, S is a function that applies S N times to whatever argument you put in there. No. Right, so then it would just be uh, M, N, S of whatever. Uh, Z, you know, like S goes to Z goes to that, something like that. That's the body. But these are like just nice little puzzles. Yeah, so I mean, uh, so if power is just take it to the next level, right, where you could just do times of, or no, do M uh, of times N C0 or whatever, something like that, right? M times And we want to do, we want to multiply, oh, I guess it's probably reversed, but uh, yeah, you want to multiply uh, the number times the number n m times right or whatever the the exponent is which I don't know which one's the exponent. So if it was yeah yeah, yeah. but there's a there's a there's a cool way to do it without using times too which I don't remember. Interesting. Without using times, but if it is just. Is this substitute times in there? Oh, it's like more clever. Mm -hmm. There's a way to, this is a shorter thing. Interesting. So to test whether a church num numeral is zero, we can pass true as zero, and for s, we pass a function that throw away its argument and always return false.
subtracting using church numerals are a bit more difficult yeah, because it's natural numbers. So we have this predecessor function, which given C0 as argument return C0 given, uh, I see. Yeah, this one is a little weird, right? You're trying to skip one result, right? Yeah. And uh, so it's kind of like you, you calculate the thing in the second part of the pair, and then every time you move it to the first part, right? So in the SS, it says uh, take in a, a pair and return a new pair where the second thing in the pair got moved to the fir in, into the first place. And then I calculate the next element. Um, it's so that I can stick a zero in at the beginning of the list of values that you get back. And yeah. then eventually I'm just gonna skip that, that zero. I think that's what it does. Right, right. So I guess I, that's a, the predecessor of zero is also zero. So that's why it works. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I think we, I think doing the exercise like later is probably still a better idea. We want to do it now. I guess I will have a look on them later. In reaching the calculus, so it says we using like church numbers, et cetera, not really convenient. So it's convenient to add more stuff into Lambda calculus which the book will call it Lambda MB, which add numbers and booleans into the Lambda calculus. And there are some conversions. This is from church number into real, sorry, church boolean into real boolean. Also, this is from the real boolean into a church boolean. So we can have functions that compare true church numerals and returns true and false, the real true and false. Also convert a church numeral into the corresponding primitive numbers by using suck and zero. I think suck is defined in last chapter. I can't remember, but I assume so.
primitive Boolean numbers come in handy because of evaluation orders. Like SCC C1, but does not evaluate into C2. In fact, because we do call by call by value. which means everything inside the abstraction will not be reduced. And so we have some, so we have some silly stuff here, which are not reduced. Also, like times will not evaluate into C4, but to something like this. But I guess this is because the book decided to use call by value. If you use like four beta reduction, then we don't have this problem. But also this is a book about programming languages, not just Lambda calculus. So this combinator if we try to reduce it by applying this to here we yeah we get the same thing again so this combinator does not have a normal form and we say it's diverge Yeah, this is a fixed point. And a bunch of exercises above fixed point, I think.
And here is a formal definition. I guess we already have the syntax. So here is just saying it in different ways. This is a set notation. Let V be a countable set of variable numbers. And T is either a variable, oh uh, yeah, this or uh, application or uh, abstraction. And yeah, we need a semantic for substitution. Which basically supplies substitution recursively. And the tricky case brings in here and another is Abstraction. Yeah, I think this is this is not correct because because when, what if we want to substitute Y, but we don't want to do that when we have an abstraction which has an argument which is the same. Yeah, he'll talk about that later, about yeah, renaming, yeah. yeah. Yeah, exactly. So, This is still not quite right. Because in this case, we, we shouldn't do anything, but instead we turn it into an identity function. I'm going to have to buy all guys. I'll see you all next time. Yeah, see you next time. Yep, bye. See you. And talks about the alpha conversion. So consistent renaming bound variable in a term. Also, here is the terms that differ only in the name of bounded variables are interchangeable in all contexts.
And we finally have a definition for substitution. And which is the same as above. But he also mentioned this is partial, so we need some way to fix that. Yeah, so it, it's basically a, just uh, implicit that you're going to rename. Yeah. So it's, it's something you have to know about. <laughs> and we, we have the semantics. Finally, it's a pretty straightforward. We always, we always evaluate the function first and then argument. Then we can only do beta reduction. So we go into this rule. Yeah, also this is this is the call by value rule. If it's if it's different evaluation strategies, then it is different. All right, we are done with this chapter.